This is David Vinegar of TwoWomen'sHealth.com. Welcome to this video on IVF and ICSI. Professor Robert Edwards, together with the gynaecologist, Mr. Patrick Steptoe, undertook the research which eventually led to the delivery of the first IVF baby, Louise Brown, in 1978. In 2010, Professor received his Nobel Prize. To date, there have been more than four million babies delivered following successful IVF treatments. In March 2011, the BBC, in their series, Bang Goes the Theory, provide us with a video demonstrating both IVF and ICSI. Right, next up, something that affects a lot of us here in the UK. In fact, one in seven people have problems conceiving. So for them, IVF, or in vitro fertilization, offers very real hope. Now, the technology has been around for about 30 years, but only last year, Dr. Robert Edwards, the pioneer of IVF, was offered a Nobel Prize for his work. In 1978, the first ever IVF baby, Louise Brown, was conceived in this very incubator. Since her birth, four million IVF babies have followed in her footsteps. This groundbreaking science isn't without controversy. For some, it raises ethical questions about creating new life. But for couples desperate to conceive, it is a lifeline. Couples like Hannah and Stuart, who are about to start their first round of IVF. So guys, how are you feeling this morning? Excited? Ner uh, nervous and excited yeah. at the same nervous. time. Hello. 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 Hello, lovely lady. Under local anaesthetic, Hannah is settled in by Dr. Matthews and his medical team. This is the crucial egg collection stage of the IVF process. And basically, Hannah has been taking lots of hormones that have induced all her follicles to develop fully to the stage where they each hopefully produce an egg. Those big black holes. Each one is a follicle. Normally in your regular cycle, you're only developing one follicle to produce one egg per month. Now, it looks like Hannah had 10 or 11 fully developed follicles, and Dr. Matthews is now extracting all the fluid from those follicles, and hopefully within that fluid, there'll be quite a lot of eggs. Dr. Matthews continues to fill the test tubes, and next door in the lab, embryologist Adam Burney is counting the eggs in each one. Finding the eggs has to happen fast to make sure everything is kept at a constant 37 degrees, the temperature inside your body. Yep, it's another egg. Another egg? It's quite a moving thing to watch it in action, to watch the needle enter a full follicle and then drain it of its liquid. While Hannah recovers, Adam is checking the final egg count. Eight, nine, ten. Yep, ten it is. Good going, eh? Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's about that's about the average number of eggs we collect for patients. So, uh, yeah, spot on, really. Yeah. With the eggs checked and counted, it's time for Stuart's sperm to undergo their own health check. How well they do will help determine the method used for fertilization. So, with every sperm sample, what exactly is it that you're looking for? OK, well, two main things. Um, the first one is the number of sperm in the sample, uh, and the second one is the motility of the sperm, that is, how, how well the sperm is moving and how well it's moving in a forward direction. Dependent on the count and the motility, we will decide whether to inject a single sperm into each egg or we will just surround each egg with a known concentration of sperm and hopefully the fertilisation will take place uh, naturally in a, in a culture dish. Oh, OK, interesting. So, well, let's have a look at Stuart's sample. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, there's lots of sperm down here, mainly moving very quickly in a forward direction, which Brilliant. is what you want to see, if you want to have a look. Yes, please. Oh, wow, no, they look great. Yeah, that's, I mean, Loads that's what I call a good sample. Which sort of brings to my mind the question, you know, Hannah's egg seemed pretty good. She produced 10 eggs, she's 30 years old. His sperm motility and number is really good. Yeah. Even now, with the, the sperm quality looking good and the eggs appearing normal, we don't know what's going to happen when we put the eggs with the sperm. You can't tell until it actually happens how many might fertilise. 
The next step is to prepare the sperm and the eggs for the all-important fertilization. So this is the stage where you are actually going to place Stuart's sperm surrounding the Anna's egg, yeah? That's right, yeah. We make up um, drops in this dish with a known concentration of sperm. I got slight butterflies because you're just about to, you know, make yeah, I mean, life, hopefully. Yeah, this is one of the most important moments, I guess, when you add the, add the sperm to the eggs. And that's it. That's it. And now the uh, eggs go back in the incubator overnight. And hopefully, if they fertilise, we'll see that first thing in the morning tomorrow. So, potentially, ten babies right yeah, there. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Good luck. And now it's a waiting game to see if any of Hannah's eggs become embryos. But in some cases, fertilisation needs more of a helping hand. Kelly and Daryl are on their second round of IVF, and after one failed attempt, Adam is using a technique known as ICSI to improve the chances of conception. So ICSI, so what does ICSI stand for again? Right, ICSI is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Basically it does what it says on the tin, right? You're basically injecting the sperm into the cytoplasm of the egg? Exactly, yeah, one single sperm, yes. This is when the father's sperm isn't, isn't as motile. Yeah, is usually right? there's either a very low sperm count or the motility is not good or right. a, a patient has previously had treatment and not fertilised, even with what appears a good sperm sample. Before we inject the sperm, we have to do something called immobilising it. What do you do? OK, what I do with this needle is strike over the top of the sperm like so. You are kidding. You just whacked it on the head? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, more or less, yep. Yeah. The sperm is still alive, but it just can't go anywhere. So I now take it into the needle. So it, you don't need it to be motile anymore? You just no. want it... So that's why you give it a bit of a thump? Yeah, you don't want it to be motile anymore. You want to be able to place the sperm into the egg and it to just sit there. That's just incredible. Oh, my gosh. So here you go. OK, what we're going to do now... Oh the sperm's gosh. right at the tip of the needle. Yeah. We're going to go through the zona and through the ulema, which is quite a stretchy membrane surrounding the cytoplasm. There it is. Apply a bit of suction to make sure it's that membrane backwards, is broken. Yeah. And then re-inject sperm with any there cytoplasm. It goes, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. That is just the most amazing thing I've ever seen, to think that that just there is potentially the beginning of a brand new life. Incredible. So, Adam, that's it. Job done. Yep. Hopefully fertilised eggs are incubating nicely in there. And then tomorrow, what do you look for? OK, when we come in in the morning, what we'll be looking for is the signs of fertilisation. Then what you should see is a male and female nucleus. But there's some bad news on day two. None of Hannah's eggs have been fertilised. She and Stuart will now have to wait six months before starting the process all over again. For Kelly and Daryl, though, things are looking brighter. The eggs fertilise to become embryos and after five days can be implanted into Kelly's womb. They'll still have a tense few weeks ahead of them as the embryo's development is closely monitored. There's lots of hurdles along the way and even when you've got good embryos, those embryos still have to implant, so there are lots of factors after growing good quality embryos that still influence whether the patient will get pregnant and, you know, go to term or not. I've heard of IVF so many times, but I have never seen those pictures before. Oh. And it gave me goosebumps to see the start of life. Oh, I what I don't understand is why aren't Hannah and Stuart conceiving, given it all seems to be fine for them in terms of healthy eggs, healthy sperm? I know, it's a big problem. It's one of the unknowns, and they're not alone. Six percent of couples have that very problem. To me, it's another reminder of the beautiful complexity of living systems and what we still have to understand. Now, Hannah and Stuart are going to get ICSI the next round, That's though. The, in injecting the sperm. Exactly. But Darren and Kelly, who have the ICSI in that film are now pregnant, which is really good news, so congratulations to you guys. The main thing that I found really interesting is that in 30 years of improved equipment, improved technology, the success rates for IVF simply have not gone up, which is fascinating. And the, the main issue is the implantation, okay? So scientists look at embryos, they wait to see whether they're dividing, multiplying, growing properly, but the longer they wait to implant that embryo, the less chance it has of planting and taking properly in the womb. But scientists in Stanford have been researching embryos. Take a look at this. This is a microscopic time-lapse photography of developing embryos, right? Yeah. 
And what they found out is that there are certain cell divisions which need to happen within very strict time windows, all right? So with that knowledge, they can now predict which of those young embryos would develop nicely to the next stage with an accuracy of about 93%. So now they can implant those embryos sooner into the womb, increasing the chances of pregnancy. So overall, the success rates of IVF would go up to 50 to 75%, which is really huge. Now, these are just the trial stages, but it's looking really good. That's a really, really big leap, isn't it? it okay, is, that yeah. is good news. In 1997, we released a major reproductive medicine textbook, and we were very proud that Professor Edwards very kindly wrote the foreword for us. The first IVF baby, Louise Brown, has gone on to produce a family of her own. IVF was initially introduced for treatment of female infertility, but whereas in 1985 perhaps just 2% of male infertility could be successfully treated, nowadays with the development of ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, we have 98% of male infertility that can be treated by ICSI. This is Dave Vinica of twowomenshealth.com. Thank you for watching this video.